Go ahead and open up with me to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 23. We are in the Old Testament. And I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. And it's going to be on the screens if you do not have your Bible. And to preface this talk, there is a king and his name is Josiah. And he is 26 years old. That is making a decision to love God with all of his heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. And we're going to pick it up in verse 1. And the Bible says this. Then the king summoned all of the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up to the temple of the Lord with all the people of Judah and Jerusalem, along with the priests and the prophets, all the people from least to the greatest. I love that, that God does not just require just one particular people group. He requires every person to come into his house. No matter if you are great, no matter if you are weak, no matter if you are strong, no matter if you are poor or you're rich, doesn't matter. He longs for everyone to come into his house. There, the king read to them the entire book of the covenant that had been found in the Lord's temple. The king took his place of authority beside the pillar and renewed the covenant in the Lord's presence. He pledged to obey the Lord by keeping all his commandments, laws, and decrees with all his heart and all his soul. In this way, he confirmed all the, uh, all the terms of the covenant that were written in the scroll and all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. It wasn't just one person who made a decision. Everybody who attended that gathering made a decision and pledged their loyalty to the Lord. Verse 4, then the king instructed Hilkiah, the, the high priest, and the priests of the second rank and the temple gatekeepers to remove the Lord's temple from, from the Lord's temple all the articles that were used to worship Baal and Asherah and all the powers of heaven. The king had all these things burned outside Jerusalem. They burned everything that no longer gave them value. Uh, and they burned outside Jerusalem on the terrace of the Kidron Valley, and he carried the ashes away to Bethel. He did away with the idolatrous priests who had been appointed by the previous king of Judah, for they had offered sacrifices at the pagan shrines throughout Judah and even in the vicinity of Jerusalem. They also offered sacrifices to Baal and to the sun and the moon and the constellations and to all the powers of heaven. Now, if you're taking notes, I want to title this talk, This No Longer Serves Me. This no longer serves me. Pain and addiction because I serve the Lord no longer serves me. Pornography addiction no longer serves me. Ego, power, no longer serves me. I wonder what you are carrying today where God just wants you to lay it at his feet and wants you to take inventory in your life to start saying, this no longer serves me. I am pursuing the love of Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your power. And God, we declare today that there are things in our life that we grew up with that no longer serve us and we lay it at your feet and we choose to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. In Jesus' name, amen. So where we pick up our passage is a very significant um, because this is written in uh, the second uh, book of Kings and, and throughout 
Kings, it is written, uh, it, it, is, it was written for the purpose to share the story of Israel and how kings were meant to serve the people of Israel by following the Lord. And one of the things that we see in First and Second Kings is a pattern, a pattern of kings following Jesus and, or following God and embracing God and opposing idolatry. And then generations after, we see other kings who rose to power that oppose God and embrace idolatry. And so this pattern is, is, is being broken every single time a, a new king rises up and gets to make a decision on what kind of direction they want to take Israel and how they want to serve the nation of Israel. And can I tell you that when they started, when kings started to oppose idolatry, and they started to embrace God's love for their life, God ended up bringing order to their chaos. But the moment kings started to oppose God and embrace idolatry, they saw themselves back in chaos. And God's vision for the world is to Live in order and not in chaos. We see that in Genesis chapter 1, where God speaks, let there be light. But before he says that, uh, the Bible says that, that the earth was formless and was without void. And it was dark. Translation, there was chaos until God spoke order into existence. He spoke light to bring order to the dark places. He created the, the heavens, the stars. He created the universe. He created the animals and he created human beings. And it was only until Adam and Eve decided to disobey God's command by eating from the knowledge of good and, of, of good and uh, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil where they went back into chaos. God's vision for humanity is to live in order. It's to live a restored life. However, humanity sometimes finds themselves back into chaos because we choose to start opposing God instead of embracing God. And here in this story, Josiah is a young 26-year-old leader who, got, uh, ro who rose up in an environment, who got raised up in an environment that was built on the foundation of chaos. His father before him and his grandfather before him tore down everything that... Uh, that God was doing in that nation and his father and grandfather started to oppose God. They started to oppose the word of God. And because they started to oppose the word of God, they forgot the story. They forgot that God's mighty hand was with them in the, in the land of Egypt. They forgot their heritage. They forgot who actually is king and who is Lord. They forgot who restores things back to order. And so jo Josiah, he is just minding his own business. And one day, his servants are cleaning out the temple of the Lord. And they find the covenant of, of God, the covenant of the law. And then they are excited because they found something significant. They found something significant 
that would actually change the trajectory of where they were going as a nation. And so they brought it to Josiah. They read the, the law and the decree. And the moment that Josiah heard the word, he tore his clothes. And he, he knew right then and there, we are living in chaos. We are not living to our full potential. We are not living to the standard that God has for us. Because the standard that God had for Israel was to embrace his love, was to embrace his kindness, was to embrace his faithfulness. It was in that moment where he heard the story of Israel being led out of Egypt through bondage and being free from, from bondage. It, it was in that moment that Josiah heard that the mighty hand of God was leading them out of Egypt and restoring them back into the promised land. It was in that moment that Josiah heard the word and how God was continuing to be faithful to Abraham's promises. It was in that moment Josiah changed something, something changed within him that said we have to get back and restore order for Israel. And I don't know about you, but what I'm about to say may sound a little discouraging or it may sound, it may seem like uh, that it, it could get, you know, uncomfortable. But I think sometimes the problem with our generation is that we tend to blame God for the outcomes of our lives instead of understanding that we end up making decisions that either oppose God or either embrace God. And here, Josiah had to make a decision. He had to make a decision to either oppose God or embrace God. And what I want to encourage us is that you actually have the power to decide what you're going to do. You have the power to decide whether or not you're going to live in chaos or whether or not you're going to live in order. You have the power to decide whether or not you will embrace God's love for your life or you will oppose God's love for your life. But what about the environment that you grew up in? Maybe that's not your fault. Maybe you grew up in an environment that, that taught you how to live in chaos, but you never knew you were living in chaos. You started to, you, 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 you learned patterns of your life of, of cheating and stealing because that was just a normal way of living. Because Josiah, that's how he lived. He lived in a normal society where opposing God was the norm. But guess what? You still have the power to decide how you are going to play the cards you are dealt with. You're still, you still have the power to decide whether or not you can choose to serve God or oppose him or not. I'm teaching my daughter how to play Uno right now. And it's awesome. She wants to play every single night. And she, as you know, you deal cards. And I got to say, she's really good. She, she, every time we play, we play like five times a night. And uh, she probably wins like four out of the five. And it's because her dad is helping her. And then whenever her mom helps her, she ends up losing. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Her mom is always helping her. But Brighton does not know what kind of cards that will help she doesn't know what kind of cards that she's going to be dealt with. She doesn't know what's going to be in her hand. All she knows is that she has to play what is in her hand. And I can't help but 
imagine and think and wonder, wonder if we have some cards that are in our hands and that we are upset and we start to blame God for what's in our hands instead of saying, hey, you know what? This actually isn't happening to me. This is actually happening for me. And I'm going to end up choosing to serve God through this. And I'm going to actually embrace God's, life, God's love for my life instead of opposing God for my life. What if we could be people that made a decision daily to follow Jesus with our heart, to love Jesus with our soul and our mind. Because here in this story, Josiah had every right to continue to move forward. But the moment he heard the word of God, conviction took place and faith took place. And he decided in that moment, I'm going to align my heart with God's heart. Josiah aligned his heart with God's heart. And you know how he did it? I believe that Josiah first changed his mind. He changed his mind. Can I encourage you that you cannot change until you change your mind? Yeah, you may like the idea of something, but in order to actually go through it, your mind has to change. And so when Josiah is hearing the story, he is hearing words like, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. He's hearing how, how, Egypt, how the Israelites were in Egypt. Actually in, Mo, actually, in Deuteronomy 6, 7, and 8, Moses is speaking to the Israelites before they go into the promised land. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. And he is hammering this message and making sure that people understand you have to love God before you go into the promised land. You've been walking with him in the wilderness for 40 years. But I promise you, if you go into the promised land, if you go into the promised land and you start to oppose God, everything will be against you. But if you go into the promised land and you trust God with your heart, soul, mind, body, and strength, and you love him, everything will go right for you. And in that moment, Josiah was hearing the story, his heritage, that he never knew, that was forgotten. And Moses even said, train your children, train your children to love God. Train actually means to train, right? So I'm not going to go to the gym and hire a, a, a personal trainer and watch them lift weights. I actually have to put into practice what they are modeling for me. If I wanted to watch someone uh, lift weights, I could just be on YouTube all day. But the job of a personal trainer is to help you do and put into practice what they have already done. And it's not only that they used to be a personal trainer, they are still a personal trainer. Because I find it funny how we as people can say, oh yeah, I used to do that, let me give you some advice. But I, I'm not here to take advice from anyone that's still not practicing what they are not preaching. Because I, am, I, I, I think our generation is done with hearing, do as I say, not as I do. Our, our generation is done with that. We want to follow people who are actually modeling what it looks like because that's what trainers do. Trainers continue to put into practice what they want to teach and they are helping people along the way. And so Moses was trying to tell the Israelite people, model for your kids what it looks like to love God. But instead, Josiah grew up with a model that was taught to oppose God. And I can't help but wonder if most of us in this room have been taught some bad habits 
and some pat bad patterns that have brought us into chaos. But I'm here to tell you today that God wants to restore order back to your life. God wants to heal you because the moment you embrace God's love, there is forgiveness, there is kindness, there is restoration, there is healing. And when you, the moment you embrace God's love for your life in the story, what's the story? Jesus came down 2,000 years ago as the Messiah, and he died on the cross for you and I sin. You, you and my sin, you, uh, ah, stop, gosh. He died for your sin and he died for my sin. How hard was that, Joseph? He died for your sin and he died for my sin. And he forgave you. His blood was shed for your life so that you could be clean and made new. That's what baptism is all about. We have baptisms today. People are declaring their faith in Jesus to say, I am made new. I am no longer bound to sin because this no longer serves me. Pain, addiction no longer serves me. Opposing God no longer serves me. What does serve me is embracing God's love for my life. Josiah made a change in his mind. The second thing is that he took action. He didn't just like the idea. He actually made steps to formulate what it looked like to love God. And so what he did was burn everything. He burned everything. Everything that he grew up with. Everything that opposed God. Everything that he knew. Everything. He burned it to the ground. And he didn't even let the ashes stay in the house. He took the ashes outside of the house. He didn't want no part of it. And I believe today that some of us need to start to apply what Josiah did in his life. And that is to align your heart with God's heart. Align your heart with God's heart. How do you do that? Well, I think we need to start to shift our mind. Shift your mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Paul says this. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you which is good and pleasing and perfect. Colossians 3.2, think about things of heaven, not the things of earth. What if we could be people that started to change our mind? I'm actually, um, I've been learning a lot about uh, just entrepreneurship recently and one of the things about entrepreneurship is that they tell you in order for you to be successful you actually have to change your mind you can't move forward and expect for you to be successful if you continue to keep putting in actions first you have to change your mind and then I was sitting there and realizing that I was like huh Paul says that to change your mind because in order for you to make steps, you have to change your mind. Your mind has to shift about the things, about how you see things in your world. The way you used to do things, like Pastor Mark said last week, the way you used to do it is no longer the way you do it. The way you used to behave is no longer the way you behave. And what God is trying to help his people out in, in, in doing this is I have to take care of your mind. Because the mind is the most powerful thing that's, that we have right now. Because our mind can tell us whether or not we're going to move forward or we're going to stay put. I don't know about you. 
But I uh, have been learning this through cold plunges. And it is devastating every single morning. And I don't like it. But I have to tell my mind, this is what we're doing. We're doing it every single day. I've been doing it since Christmas, praise God. And there was one day I got in that tub and I was like, nope, I'm out. Not doing it today. And I, I looked at myself and I was like, Joseph, you committed to it, commit. But I think oftentimes as people, we start to go back and forth and our mind is not made up. We like the idea of something, but we don't end up moving forward because our mind is not made up. We like to stay where we are because we like to be comfortable. The moment we start to change our mind means that we are getting in uncomfortable situations. And the moment we start to follow God means we get uncomfortable because it's no longer that I am serving the addiction. I am actually doing something new that is actually serving me to move forward. I am, it's no longer that I love the things that I used to do because I love God. And yes, this is a brand new territory. Yes, it is scary. Yes, it is uncomfortable. But I promise you, it is fulfilling. Have you ever done something that you did not want to do? But the moment you did it, you were actually glad you did it. Like waking up this morning, man, I just wanted to sleep in this morning. But I'm glad I made it to church today. Man, I, 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 just, I just want to, I, I, we, just ended up, we just ended our fast. I didn't even want to do our 21-day fast, but I'm glad I did the fast. Because God was faithful to give revelation. It is all about changing your mind. Your mind has to shift. Your mind has to shift and be made new. And then number two, we as people have to make a move. Make a move. Don't just sit. Don't just stand there. If you don't even know what to do, do something. Make a move. I love what James says in uh, James chapter 2. He says this in, in verse 17, see that faith by itself is not enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 7, 24, anyone who listens to my teachings and follows it is like a wise person who builds a house on solid rock. Anyone who does what I teach. See, Jesus was not about people just listening into what he was saying. He was about giving people vision and helping people take action. I heard a quote the other day, and this quote said, vision without action is merely a dream. Action without vision is wasted time. But vision and action, with vision and action, you can change the world. Oftentimes, I can find myself in the action without vision for my life. And I feel like I'm on a, a, a hamster on a wheel, just doing this over and over and over again. But you know, God has vision for my life. And God has vision for your life. That church is not just supposed to be an action item and a to-do list. But this, can I give you some vision for church? The vision for community is that we don't do life alone. And that you would connect with one another. And that you would do life with each other and help each other along the journey. That's why we have ministry teams. That's why we have connect groups. That's why we have uh, encounter nights and Saturday morning prayers. We want to do life together and not alone. It's us as a community, all of us taking action, taking the next steps 
of our faith together. Vision. Vision. The vision is for God to help you love him with everything that you have, everything that you are, everything, your whole being, the reason why you exist is to love God. But in order to love God, you have to know that he first loved you. He first loved you. Vision. He loves you. He is for you. He wants to restore what is broken in your life. He wants to rebuild your life back up. And you know, the thing about Josiah is that he did not come to God when he was already clean. Josiah came to God already as he was. He came as he is and as is, and he came to God and God restored his life. And it's the same for us, that we don't have to come to God clean, but God actually cleans us. And that when we take action to come into the presence of God, that he will transform us, that he will make us new, that he will restore us, that he will rebuild us, that he will take us on a new journey of restoration. The life that I used to know no longer serves me. No longer. Not anymore. I lay it at your feet, Jesus. And I don't know about you. I don't know what's in your hands. I don't know what you are battling with. I don't know the things that are in your life that is holding you back from moving into the promises of God for your life. But I want to encourage you that you can make a decision today to change your mind and that you can take action. Because the moment you do, you will be fulfilled in your life. Would you stand with me today, church? Now, some of you grew up in an environment most of us maybe have grew up in an environment that's all about opposing God and, and we, we lived in chaos. And you don't even know what to do. You don't know the next steps. You don't know how to move forward. But can I encourage you today that it may be scary to do something new, but you will be fulfilled. And today can be a new day for your life because Jesus wants to restore your soul. He wants to bring you back home and let you know that you are his. And the moment you embrace him and the moment you leave behind the chaos, you will be restored back to order. And today with every head bowed, and every eye closed. You may be in here or tuning in online and you're saying to yourself, I need to start to embrace God with my everything. And you are in here and you're saying, I want to make a decision to follow Jesus with my life. Because here's the thing, Jesus came down 2000 years ago to save you, to restore you. He died on the cross for your sins, but he did not just die. He rose again in three days and is now seated on the throne as king. Just like Israel got out of Egypt, we have gotten out of spiritual bondage because of Jesus. And that is your story and that can be your story today. And so if you want to make that your story, you want to change your mind and you want to take action, the action step that I want you to take today is to believe. Believe that Jesus died, he rose, and he's Lord. Because the moment that you believe that, you will be saved. And so if you believe that today, 
and you want to make a decision today to believe that for the first time or for the second time or third time, whatever, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. If that's you, raise your hand. Praise God. Yes, Jesus. I see those hands. Come on, raise them up high so we know who we're praying for. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on. Don't want to rush this moment. Don't want to rush this moment. Praise God. Come on, church. Can we just celebrate what God is doing in this house today? If you pray, if you lifted up your hands, we just want to say welcome home. And we're celebrating with you. And we want you to take three action steps today. Number one, get a Bible and start reading it. Number two, get connected to a church. And number three, tell somebody. After baptisms, we're going to have a prayer team down at the front, and we would love to pray with you and walk with you on this journey. But right now, let's take the next step and pray together. Can we pray this prayer together as a church family? Jesus. Jesus. I believe. I believe. In my heart. In my heart. That you are Lord. That you are Lord. And that you rose again. And that you rose again. And that I am saved. And that I am saved. I choose, I choose to love you, to love you with all of my heart, with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my soul, all of my mind, all of my mind, all of my strength. All of my strength. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give Jesus Amen. a shout of praise today.